Welcome everyone to another iteration of Training with Power 101 here at Trainer Road. I'm Coach Chad Timmerman. Um, along with me is Coach Jonathan Lee. Uh, I'll be leading you through the lecture portion of today's presentation, um, and I'll describe in just a minute how that breaks down, after which Jonathan and I are both going to field some questions uh, in a brief Q&A session. We're going to move on to the basics of training, then we'll move on to the basics of training with power, and then we'll tell you how to put it all together and best utilize Terrain and Road to help you figure all of this out. Okay, so to kick things off, we're going to start with power basics. Starting with what is power. <clears throat> power is simply an objective measure of how much work you're doing. And in our case, we measure force and we measure uh, speed. So not only how hard you're pushing on the pedals, but how quickly you're turning the pedals over. Um, what in particular makes power a, a perhaps a more reliable or the best single metric in terms of uh, training uh, with endurance sports, but cycling in particular, is uh, first off, it's objective. So it doesn't matter what sort of day you're having, um, 300 watts is 300 watts. Secondly, it's measurable. And we actually measure the work you're putting out in watts. And thirdly, it's comparable or comparable. So whether year to year, phase to phase, rider to rider, workout to workout, you can see how one workout stacks up to another. Okay, now um, I mentioned earlier how power is arguably or inarguably, depending on who you ask, the superior single metric when it comes to uh, measuring the amount of, your, of work you're doing as an endurance athlete. Um, prior to the advent, or at least the availability of power-based, or I'm sorry, power meters, uh, endurance athletes relied pretty much on either rate of perceived exertion or heart rate or a combination of the two. Um, where power excels, um, or why it excels over these two is something I'll, I'll briefly discuss. Um, relative to RPE or your rate of perceived exertion, how you, how you feel, um, this is typically measured on a one to 10 scale, a six to 20 scale. And it's very much relies on how experienced an athlete is. Whereas power, once again, is a, an objective measure of your work. So if you were to train solely by perceived exertion, if you look at the example we have to the right there, um, in, in a, workout of you know, short, intense repeats, the athlete goes out what he or she feels to be the, the highest effort he can sustain, and tries to repeat these efforts. And in his own mind, he feels like he is doing this same amount of work over and over again. Whereas if you look at the actual power output, uh, the, it, it's falling with each interval. Yet his rate of perceived exertion remains high. So he feels like he's doing the work when in fact the work's not actually being done. Whereas the athlete or the workout just below that, this athlete is training by power and does exactly what is necessary. Hits the marks, recovers, hit the marks, does it every single time. Um, so, so whereas training by perceived exertion or RPE is subjective, uh, power is very much objective. Then when it comes to training via heart rate and in comparison to training with power, you can well, a couple of the, or one of the downsides to training with heart rate is that there's a delayed response, which isn't as a, much a consequence um, in longer intervals it is, as it is in shorter ones. Um, over longer intervals, your heart rate has a chance to stabilize, whereas with short ones, there's a lag. So if we are training by heart rate uh, via, uh, during a shorter uh, interval workout, there's a good chance you wouldn't have actually reach your target heart rate level in the time allotted and think that you'd miss the mark or you miss the objective of the interval when in fact you were actually uh, right on in terms of power output. So heart rate serves as more a measure of how hard your body's working, whereas power is actually the output, the work that's being done. Okay, and then when it comes to measuring caloric uh, expenditure, or your calorie burn, a uh, big difference. Um, first off, you can't really measure it with rate of perceived exertion. It would take a very experienced athlete to be able to relate his uh, how he feels during a workout to how many calories he's actually burning. Um, with heart rate, you're kind of at the mercy of a myriad of different types of uh, uh, tools or uh, training devices that estimate expenditure based on heart rate. And the discrepancies there range anywhere from 20 to 50%, uh, typically above what you've actually burned. Whereas power um, uses kilojoules to determine your caloric expenditure and does a, a far more accurate job than, than heart rate does. Um, if you look at our little example here, um, rider one heading up the hill using heart rate to estimate caloric expenditure. 
uh, estimates at 1700, whereas the rider using power estimates much more closely to 1100, which is far more feasible. And then uh, to, to further delve into the caloric expenditure aspect of things, uh, the the way we calculate via power your your calories burned is by converting kilojoules, basically one to one uh, to kilocalories or you know big C calories calories. So because most of the work you do is actually utilized uh, via thermal regulation, cooling your body down, um, roughly three fourths of the work you do is used in this capacity, whereas the other quarter of your energy is actually put to the pedals and powers you down the road. So for our purposes, one kilojoule equals about a calorie burned. Okay, so that's a brief overview of the basics of power. So now we'll move on to some basics of training, starting with uh, three of the fundamentals. Um, of course, there are others, but we'll focus on these three, the first of which is consistency. So consistency with anything yields results. Um, as long as you do it and you do it often, repeatedly on a particular schedule, chances are you're going to improve. Um, secondly, we'll touch on recovery. Um, just training and the this, this stress you incur during training is only half the, uh, the uh, adaptation equation, the other half being recovery. And then there's progression. So as you as an athlete improve, um, you have to continue to further the challenge or your adaptive response stalls. So we'll expand a little bit on each of those three things, starting with consistency. Um, consistency in, in, in all aspects of training, um, first of which is nutrition and recovery. If you neglect your nutrition, if you recover poorly, your performance will start to suffer. Um, then when it, when it comes to the quality and the quantity of the workout itself or the intervals or even the, the training phase, there's an inverse relationship between the intensity and the duration of the work you're doing. So the harder you work, the less you can do it. Um, the more moderately or conservatively you, you work, the longer miles you can accumulate or the longer hours, I should say. Um, and then consistency and structure and discipline. So to follow a training plan is one thing to loosely follow it is another and to cherry pick your workouts and hope for the best is also another. And then there's consistency when it comes to your training environment and your training setup. So equipment to, to capture all of that. So the environment, uh, ideally is cool, especially when it comes to indoor training. Cooling is a, is a, a major factor or a major limitation to training indoors, um, and then distractions. So whether you choose to watch TV or uh, read a book or w whatever, uh, the less focus you are on the work you're doing, well, probably the less productive it's going to be. Um, and then as, in terms of equipment setup, um, everything from tire pressure to the, the pressure of the, of the trainer itself, the little friction roller dialed up against your tire, um, these things and the consistency um, with them is uh, pretty important from workout to workout. So if one day you inflate your tires to 80 PSI, the next day you do it to 100 PSI, you might have a slightly different rolling resistance, you might get slightly different numbers, and your data consistency suffers, and potentially so does your training. Um, and then when it comes to recovery, like I touched on earlier, it's just as important as the stress itself. It could be argued that it's more important because that's when the, the healing takes place. That's when the, the compensation or ideally the super compensation takes place and the training that you undergo, that you subject yourself to routinely um, actually yields some, some benefits and you become stronger. Um, for instance, we've got a couple rider pro or a couple riders here and each of the red bars is, is a week, the blue bar being the fourth week or the recovery week. In rider one's situation or scenario, um, she progresses the load from week to week and then takes an adequate recovery week, comes back on week five and progresses it for another couple of weeks, assuming, and we assume she'll take another recovery week. Whereas rider two does the same thing, progresses well, but kind of cheats the recovery week and goes into the fifth, sixth, and seventh weeks fatigued and increasingly fatigued and therefore performance starts to, starts to taper off. Um, Oh, and it, 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 uh, it, it's also, is it not a guessing game exactly, but there is certainly some trial and error that comes into this whole uh, situation in determining just how much fatigue uh, a rider can, can tolerate before they need to recover and then just how much recovery a rider needs before they can rebound successfully from previous training. So we, we typically, or I typically design the training plans to 
uh, trim off about 30, 30 to 40 percent on a recovery week doesn't necessarily mean that's going to work for you. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for every athlete. So if you find yourself emerging from a recovery week in still a fatigue state and your first couple of workouts show you I'm still tired, well, you know that you're not going to benefit from the exact design of the training plan, in which case, you know, maybe modify it. That's, it's really kind of beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. But the point is people re respond to recovery differently. And then <clears throat> let's touch on, or uh, let's expand a bit on progression. Uh, first of which, uh, the workouts and the training load has to be progressed steadily. So you can't have any big leaps in training. And uh, if the leaps are too small or the increases are too small from week to week, then chances are you're not really pushing yourself to your full capabilities. You may not improve as an athlete as rapidly as you could. Um, and that also relates to the proper rate of increase. So just how much of a, of a increase or, you know, what sort of ramp rate can we utilize or you utilize from week to week to see to it that you're pushing yourself to your, your true boundaries, recovering and coming back and, and doing it again without overdoing it. Um, and then well time decreases, which basically just goes back to what we just discussed, recovery and properly timed and adequate uh, amounts. Okay, so now uh, let's mash those two together and talk a little bit about power-based training basics. So the basis for all of this is, uh, at least for our, our, our training approach, is functional threshold power. And all functional threshold power is, is uh, our best guess or an estimate of how much power you could exert over the course of about an hour. Um, there's a lot of names for this particular uh, theory or concept. Um, I've heard it called hour power, lactate threshold power, MLSS is maximal lactate steady state, which is perhaps the most descriptive in that we're looking for that point where you're working hard and your lactate levels start to level off. Um, 40K TT power, anaerobic threshold, million names all means the same thing. It's, it's your highest sustainable power for about an hour. Um, and we assess this, uh, we offer a few different ways to do it, but once we have that assessment, it serves as the basis for everything, um, every way in which we tailor your training from that point forward. Um, starting with your power zones. So your, your power zones are subjective. They're very much based on you as a rider. And, and we tie all this back to your functional threshold. So, um, we, in, in the case of trainer road, we rely on, uh, Coggin, Andrew Coggins power levels, and they're all a percentage of functional threshold. So this allows us to keep things personal and it also also allows us to keep things tidally dynamic so that every time you improve your functional threshold your power levels change with it so if you're going to do a vo2 max workout and your fitness is uh, 200 watts and then four weeks you retest or six weeks you retest your functional threshold goes up to 220 watts your vo2 max intervals increase with them we we, we calculate new ranges um, for you to target during particular types of workouts um, and then intensity factor. This is simply a, a description of how intense a workout is. Um, the basis for it also being functional threshold in that if you ride at your functional threshold power for 60 minutes, you achieve a 1.0 intensity factor and everything's relative to that. So for instance, if you're riding sweet spot, you're working at an intensity factor of 0.88 to 0.94. So about 88% to 94% of the hour, uh, the power you could, or the work you could do over the course of an hour although it's not limited to an hour. So it simply describes the intensity of any duration ride. And once again, is tied to your particular fitness, your functional threshold power. And then all this kind of comes together and coalesces into a single metric that allows us to quantify how much work you're doing on a weekly or monthly or annual basis. Um, and we call this training stress score or more simply TSS. And like I just said, it's a, it's a metric that we use to quantify your training load so that we can see how much you're doing so that we can recognize patterns and trends. So we can see, you know, like I talked about ramp rate earlier, you know, how, how quickly can we escalate, escalate your training load in a productive manner, not push you too far, but push you far enough that we're exploiting your potential. Um, and then just to give you some perspective, and this might be overestimated a little but um, a, a, a typical recreational rider doing five 50 TSS rides a week, which aren't particularly demanding, but it's something that's a, that's a 250 TSS week. Whereas if you compare this rider to a grand tour rider, they can accumulate upwards of 10 times that amount. 
in a single week, depending on, you know, the format of that week and how smartly or unsmartly they ride. And then finally, normalized power. And this doesn't exactly tie into those, but it is based on your functional threshold. So in that sense, it does. Um, and normalized power is simply an alternative to average power. And it's uh, arguably a better one, especially for efforts that aren't steady state or even keel. In that it gives you credit um, for the physiological stress you're inflicting on your body. So when you work steadily for long periods of time, average power is actually quite useful. It doesn't differ too much. And if you look at that second example, or I'm sorry, that top example there, you can see for a very steady state workout, normalized power and average power are very similar. But if you look at the workout below, which is more indicative of a lot of the types of races people do, mountain bike, cycle cross, um, even group rides where there's hard efforts followed by recovery efforts and downhills and whatnot, um, normalized power gives the rider far more credit for, for those, the, the, those periods of high, high intensity output. So it, put, put simply, it's a weighted average and it gives you credit and credit for the different types of efforts and the physiological stress they inflict on your body. Okay. And then finally, uh, lots of information to process. So we at trainer road, try to make all this, uh, much more simple, simple for you. And we do it in a number of ways. The first of which is FTP based workouts. So knowing your functional threshold, we can then scale every workout that you do through trainer road to that number. And every time that number changes, so too do your workouts. They, they rise or fall in accordance with changes in your functional threshold power. Um, we also offer a huge variety of workouts. Um, at last count, over 800 workouts, largely developed by me, but that number grows every day, especially as I'm putting training plans together. And uh, I can add 20 more workouts to that catalog in a single day. So very big workout catalog. Um, and in the instance that we don't offer a workout, a particular workout or a workout modification that you're looking for, um, we have a workout creator that allows you to do this really simply. It's quite user-friendly. Um, and then also we offer training guidance and we do this in a, a number of ways, this webinar being one of them. Um, also the training plans that I just mentioned, new ones coming out all the time, um, are wealth of resources continues to grow, whether it's the plans, the on-screen text in the workouts themselves, the workouts themselves, our existing help center, our upcoming learning center, and our support staff, which continues to grow along with everything else. And that about wraps it up. So we'll take a couple minutes here, allow some questions to funnel in, and then we'll get back to you. Uh, in the meantime, uh, just take a minute and, and, and don't hesitate to fire off any questions that come up, whether they relate to what we covered here today or anything else, cycling or power-based training. We'll get back to you in just a minute. All right, we're back. Uh, this is Coach Jonathan here, and we're going to rip through some of the questions that you have for us. Thanks for, for sticking around for this portion. This is where, this is where it really gets valuable for you. Uh, first question we have is from Greg, and Greg asks, how important is the use of the cadence meter and or heart rate monitor when training for power? Uh, I mean, I, I believe that they're, especially cadence, cadence is important to mm -hmm. have. Heart rate gets a little different. Chad, what do you say? Um, if you're asking if you only have one metric with which to train, then you know, power is absolutely it. But any information that you can add, add to your uh, experience is going to serve you uh, should you choose to analyze it. So um, cadence is particularly useful. Heart rate is especially useful, um, in conjunction with power. So my opinion and probably most coaches opinions, at least those who train with power is collect as much data as possible, whether or not you ever use it, at least is there, should you choose to. And if I could add one thing to that too, uh, especially with heart rate, um, if you're trying to establish some type, type of consistent point of reference between a, a wattage and a, and a heart rate target, yes. that can be effective, but at the same time, you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt because if yeah. you find yourself in a race and you're looking down and your heart rate's through the roof and you're putting out wattage that generally doesn't require such a high heart rate, don't let that psych you out. Um, it, it may just for, there's so heart rate is so variable. There could be many reasons why your heart rate is, is, is elevated at that point. So, um, it, if anything, heart rate is very beneficial in post in, in analysis of, of your mm -hmm. rides and, and it's very helpful in trending analysis. And that's what I was just going to say over time, you can start to notice trends. So from day to day, you might get um, some misleading heart rate readings um, and don't let, don't let them rattle you. 
But over time, you start to recognize trends, um, largely tied to recovery, but also due to or, or tied to improvements in performance and aerobic response. Yeah, and cadence is really valuable in that sense as well. In the yep. sense, you'll be able to comprehend where your body effectively or, or comfortably sits mm -hmm. at a certain RPM, and then you may need you may notice that you have to alter that increase or decrease and yeah. and of all course we have reasons. cadence based workouts too which obviously are best done with cadence correct pretty tough to count revolutions per minute when yeah, you're putting out sure. lots <laughs> perfect um alf you ask uh, can this be linked to online videos and i assume that you're meaning uh, trainer road if it can be linked to online videos and yes it can um what you can do is on the desktop software, uh, you can just click that button that says horizontal on top of your your video or on top of the, the workout window. That will pin Trainer Road to the bottom of the screen, but on top of any browser that you may have. So if you're watching Netflix or watching a race or watching any type of workout video, you can do that. But then you can also use the workout creator itself to go through and to actually um, to share uh, or I should say to attach a video to a workout, which is hugely valuable. So if you have a, um, a GoPro video or something like that and you want to make a workout that goes and you know coincides with that, that's perfect. Uh, another question. I use an iPad with a trainer. Is there any way to know the suggested workout for a given day other than looking at your website? Uh, any way for the app to tell me which I should use? That's something that we want to that we're pushing for, and it will it will actually be instituted at some point. Um, right now, there is no type of automated calendar uh, solution that we have. So, I mean, Chad and I are just like you in the sense that we end up writing the workouts down or mm -hmm. checking them every day on the phone, whatever you end up doing. Um, but uh, there will be a, an integrated calendar solution at some point. It's on the way, and it'll make Chad and I very happy. So, <laughs> indeed. Uh, another question, how can one develop a training program? Well, that's a pretty big question, um, especially, I guess, Chad, what are the main principles that you want to address when you're coming down to that? What are the main things you want to identify before getting into that? Um, well, basically, our approach is a, a periodized approach. So we start with base, move on to build training, and then your, your race-specific training. So we go from a point of uh, general fitness onto uh, slightly more specific fitness onto very specific fitness. So if you're piecing together or cobbling together your own training plan, I'd, I'd recommend the same approach. We're, we're fond of the periodized approach. Um, more simply for you, um, just pick a training plan and go with it. Um, again, we, we follow that same progression. We offer two base options and then three build options and then a whole host and ever growing host of specialty options. Exactly. And just like Chad said, tailor it to what you're going to do. It's pretty simple. Uh, another question, uh, any recommendation for mixing training plan workouts with real world outdoor rides? It's mm. really common. Yeah, solution. we get this question a lot and I, I, I basically a canned response in that I try to do most of my, uh, higher quality workouts indoors. The ones where I'm trying to hit very particular wattage marks, or I know they're, they're very stressful and the fewer distractions, the better. Um, and then I saved a more general riding for outdoors the you know, 70% or even 80% and lower sort of rides. So anytime it's high mileage, something that could get, you know, pretty monotonous indoors. If I have the option, I'll definitely head, out, head outdoors. Um, but I do just about all of my interval training indoors or on the race course. Uh, let's see. This uh, question, how often do I retest FTP? Should I retest or just manually increase my FTP? You're riding, and you mentioned that you're riding about four times a week with a plan, um, or riding four times a week with a plan doesn't really afford time for another test. Mm -hmm. With Within the training plans, especially the build plans, um, there will be FTP assessments built in, correct, Chad? Yeah, my, it, the FTP assessments often serve as a workout, and I try to time them at a time where you need that type of workout, so a steady state workout. Um, I also understand that some people know themselves well enough that they don't need to assess as frequently as newer athletes or athletes who are newer to training with power. In which case, you know, you can do exactly what you suggested and that you just nudge your threshold up a little bit when you start getting through the workouts and feeling like you can handle a, a greater workload. Uh, I do caution against going crazy with it. Um, the increases on, you know, like a, every three or four week basis tend to be no higher than a couple, free, a few percent. Um, that, that too is subjective depending on your background and, you know, how quickly you respond to training. But um, be 
conservative. Um, but absolutely, if you feel you've gotten stronger, nudge that number up a little bit and see how the next few workouts go. But successful completion is paramount. So if you're, if you just brought your number up and you start to fail and you're not finishing intervals, you're ducking out of workouts early, your quality is suffering in any way, then, you know, you probably got a little too carried away. And getting an accurate fix on your FTP is so important, especially with trainer road, um, in the sense that all of the workouts are scheduled to it. So a general recommendation many times is four to every four to six weeks. And yeah. Typically with the training plans, we get you about every four to six weeks. Right. And if you feel as if, uh, you know, you don't need to assess or anything else, just like, I mean, Chad just laid out every type of condition that would exist with that, mm -hmm. with that type of scenario. So hopefully that, uh, sets that up. Another question here, how do I know, or how tight do I tighten the trainer against my rear tire? Um, how do I know how tight I should go? That's a great question. And it's one of the more common ones that we get. Um, it's something that seems simple, but it's not quite so simple. So really the, the answer is make it objective. Um, and what I mean by that is, for example, just to share with you, what I do is when I tighten up my trainer, I tighten up the, or I move the spindle closer to my tire until it makes contact. Once it makes contact, I know how many quarter turns in my case, it's six quarter turns. And six quarter turns gets me to the point where if I were to hold onto the spindle and not let it move and then grab my tire and, and try to make it nudge, it would just barely be able to move. Not much. Um, you know, if you're standing up on the pedals and pedaling really hard and you get slip out of your tire, it's not the end of the world. Um, mm. if you know, don't test it by just jamming on the pedals as hard as you can. And if it slips, tighten it up. Um, you know, if it's slipping very easily when you're in the saddle, putting down normal efforts, then you, you want to tighten it up, but, mm -hmm. uh, find that sweet spot you should see a little squish out of that tire. Uh, if your tire is inflated properly and then make it objective, count how many turns you need to do. Even if it's just, you know, use a marker to put some lines on there and count that as it goes around, whatever you need to do. And you might find that different workouts require a little extra press on. So if for instance, you're doing, um, maybe you're getting out of the saddle and it slips, or you're really jamming on the pedals and it, it slips a little bit. Um, pause the workout, hop off really quickly and give yourself one more quarter turn. Often it's that fine of a line. So, so mm -hmm. one quarter turn, maybe you get back on, it slips again, hop off, give it another quarter turn. That total of a half turn is probably all you're going to need. Perfect. And, and then keep that consistent. Once you've found what it is, keep it consistent, especially if you're using virtual power, because then you'll know that from workout to workout, if you keep your tire pressure the same, and then you keep that pressure from the roller the same you're set. Uh, you, you don't have to worry about any discrepancies in power that you might have in there. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, I've been training for, a, I've been following the base plan, the sweet spot base plan and moved into a general build and I'm looking, so that's cool following that portion there. Um, and they're looking to go into, uh, or prepare for a grand Fondo that they're going to be riding at the end of May. What's the best plan that they should do? Chad, what do you say? Um, you're on the right track. Um, do you say general build? General build. Yeah, the sustained power build might be a better fit, but the general build is a catch-all, so it'll work for, for about anything. Um, as far as what specialty block to move on to next, um, we have existing century plans, although they're more time crunch plans than specific century plans, which is why I'm developing new century plans right now. And I'm just about done with the mountain bike plans. And century plans are up next. So there'll be a brief break in there to develop the, the ADC workouts, which is just around the corner. But after that, it's back on with the century plan. So there's a good chance. Well, if you're, if your grand fund in May, actually you're, you're probably set to just stick with the sustained power build or the general build, and that'll carry you right into your grand fondo. Um, and then by the time you get through that build plan, wherever you are relative to your grand fondo, the century plans will probably be available. Perfect. I like it. Another question that somewhat relates to what we were talking about, um, about tire pressure and virtual power and consistency. Uh, the question is I use virtual power and my friend uses a power meter and my power readings seem like they're too high, um, compared to that with his friend. That's a really common situation as well, uh, for you to get power readings that would be, that would be changed from not only person to person, but power to power meter. One thing that's really important to remember that it's hard to compare <clears throat> power numbers from person to person. Even in the case that you guys weigh exactly the same, it's still going to be tough because different people put out power in different ways. You know, you may have a very good short power while another person may have great sustained power. And mm -hmm. 
So comparing power from one person to another is, it can be a little difficult and problematic. If you're on different devices, especially. And, and in your case, you might have a trainer with a friendly, friendly uh, speed to power curve. In which case, you know, we get a lot of this information from the manufacturers. We haven't actually tested the trainers, so we just have to trust that they, they're giving us good, reliable data. Um, and they may, in fact, overestimate power output relative to the speed that you're putting into the trainer. So if your power seems inflated, it might be, but as long as it's consistent from ride to ride, you can track your progress and you know whether you're improving or not. Um, and then, you know, the proof is in the pudding. You get out on the road with your friend, then you can actually see, you know, who's more powerful. Yeah, and when you break that down, of course, break it down in terms of power to weight when you're trying to see who's faster That's on the road. Yeah. You know, it's so power is is very um, it's very objective from individual to individual and very measurable. Uh, it's measurable as well when you go from a person to a person, but not necessarily comparable and just a directly across sense. You may need, you may need to you have to take into consideration different things with virtual power. too, one other thing I would add is make sure that your spindle the the, the res, that the roller is tightened against your tire sufficiently. If you find that, you know, you're, you're spinning and it's nice and easy on that trainer. And we have a power curve that set up for ideal pressure against that tire. And, and you don't have that ideal pressure, then you may be spinning like crazy. And it may say that you're Superman with your legs there. So, um, so once again, keep those variables consistent and set in a good place. Those variables being tire pressure and being roller pressure. And if you keep those two things the same and uh, you're using it, then you'll, you'll get consistent ratings. So that's what really matters in the end is consistency day to day. So um, uh, another question, how do I uh, use one of the trainer road training programs or one of the training plans? Uh, we have them up on the website. If you go in to look at the top bar there, you'll see a section that says training plans and pick on or click on that training plan area and you'll see that we have it separated into three phases base build and specialty those are cumulative in nature but not necessarily cumulative in the sense that you can jump in at a certain point uh, for example if you feel like you're base conditioned then you can jump in with a build plan and and work your way into a specialty plan or if you don't really have an event that you're preparing for you can build for a while as well and repeat build. So, and if you're an experienced athlete and you know, you've got a reasonable basis of fitness, you can pick your specialty plan and dive right into it. Um, it just with, with the caveat that, um, you get out of it, what you put into it. So if you're training for an important event and you're only willing to dedicate eight weeks to it, you can't expect the same results you would get if you're going to develop, uh, sorry, devote eight months to it. Certainly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so really you, you go through there, you look at the training plans, you see one, it's got all the workouts laid out on a calendar for you. Uh, then you just have use that as a point of reference. So then you know which workout to do every day. Um, yeah, and I think the web text on the, the plans page kind of gives you an idea of, you know, which base plan should I choose, which build plan best suits me. And then we kind of try to steer you, uh, as, as best we can. Uh, but we are, I know, I don't know, I know it's been tabled or it's postponed, whatever, but we do have plans to have a more automated process that where you type in certain parameters, what type of athlete you are, what uh, sort of hours you have per week to train, when your event is, and we'll mash all that together and give you a, a progression that, that very well suits your, uh, your needs. Absolutely. But that's in the works and I can't say exactly when that's going to crop up. Uh, another question, uh, you're a longtime cyclist and an athlete in good shape, and you're just beginning to follow a training plan and train with power. Uh, should I start with building an aerobic base or start interval training now? So we have an athlete who is a longtime cyclist and in good shape and wants to know if, uh, even though they're new to training with, uh, to training with power and training plans are wondering if they should start with base training or not. Uh, it kind of depends where you are in your season. If your events are reasonably close and I suspect they are, if you're North American, um, you might not have time for all of that. And if you've already, if you've got a, a healthy background of cycling or endurance sports in general, um, the base training, um, while certainly important could, could be bypassed for sure. If you're close to your events, your build conditioning is probably going to be, will be much more vital in that uh, it's going to be more representative of the sort of efforts you're going to have to dole out come race day. Absolutely. And it also, well, I think maybe one thing to, to consider too is to kind of play the long ball in the sense that if you do feel like if you do move into base and you move in there, but you feel that you're getting tired after a couple months and you feel really exhausted this season because mm. you've been training hard, um, use that information. 
when you look at examining your next, you know, the, the next bout of training that you're looking to go through, right? Sure. Um, yes. uh, perfect. And, and one, and, and a, I guess I should say a modification to a previous question that we had about how to pick a training program. Uh, you mentioned with uh, so many workouts, how do you choose or find a training plan? Just like I said, so the workouts themselves fall within the training plans. Um, you can cherry pick workouts if you'd like. That isn't necessarily an organized approach to go about it. That's what the training plans are for, is they take care of that workout selection process. And what they're intentional and placed in such a manner is to prepare your fitness for an event. So like I said, you go onto the website. So if you're using the app on iOS or anything else, just go to trainerroad.com. And in fact, I think you can go to just slash training plans um, and mm -hmm. just click on training plans there. That will take you to where you need to go. You'll see those plans. Uh, click on base, click on build, click on specialty, check it out and read the text because just like Chad said, we put some time into making sure that that was instructive and that you know, gave you the hints or perhaps the direction that you would need in selecting a training plan and base it off of your needs. In other words, if you're a triathlete, you're going to find triathlon plans. If you're a mountain biker, you'll find mountain bike plans, road cyclist, road plans. We built them specifically for those disciplines. If you are just starting out, you start out with base. And if you feel like you're already base conditioned, pick a build. So, and if you're still completely lost, just uh, send an email to our support desk and Tell us, you know, when your event is uh, basically as much succinct information as you can uh, provide us with. What type of athlete? What type of event? How many training hours a week? And uh, that's a good start right there. We yeah. Try to steer you in the right direction. Absolutely. Perfect. So go ahead and uh, type those questions in if you have any more. Uh, we'll take a, a brief little recess here as we let more questions roll in. And we'll be right back. All right, we're back, and here's uh, another few questions. Which is preferable, in your opinion, a trainer or rollers with adjustable resistance? Uh, I guess we can both kind of speak to this with our experience. Chad has a lot of experience with a number of trainers, and then everyone here at the office kind of has a, a fair amount of experience with a lot of trainers. We have a lot of them here. And I, I believe that they both serve a purpose mm -hmm. in the sense that trainers allow you to very much just focus on precision power output. Whereas rollers um, with adjustable resistance, like you said, I think that's key. Just riding on a set of rollers, sure, it has its place in some people's repertoire. But really, for me, if those rollers don't have resistance or variable resistance, then it's I'm not getting, I'm not spending my time as wisely as I could otherwise. Yeah, but I think you said uh, rollers with a resistance unit, but it's still the the level of control that you have to maintain to ride rollers can be a a, a whole training phase in and of itself. So you have to be especially good on rollers to be able to actually work really hard on rollers without, you know, falling off or uh, making some, yeah. some mistake. But, uh, uh, I, I absolutely advocate tro uh, rollers, but ideally you do the hard work on the trainer and the, the, the more moderate, uh, form based work on the rollers kind of, kind of ties with that indoor versus outdoor workouts. I think that's a great way to do it right there is uh, those less intense workouts. That's a great opportunity for you to maybe bring in some form work on mm -hmm. those rollers. And, and also keep in mind that riding on the rollers is not representative of riding outside. I think a lot of people say that, and it is not, it's a unique experience. So mm -hmm. while it will build, um, while it will increase efficiencies in, in certain ways, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily replicate the outdoor experience any more than, than a trainer. No, it does, it does wonders experience. for balance and pedal stroke and, and, uh, and a lot of form issues. But um, when it comes time to work hard, it's just one more thing that you have to deal with when you're already dealing with many. Right. And also keep your eye out for new rollers. I mean, we see... I'm sure you guys see as well, uh, a lot of new designs coming out with rollers. Mm. Uh, we've tested some here in the office that They're have suspended cool boom racks that yeah. allow the rollers to move with you when you're on the bike. And it really is, it's, it's a, it's a cool experience. And even there's rumors of some that involve some other technology that are pretty darn cool too. So we'll see. Um, so I do think that rollers have a place just like Chad said, but, um, if you're looking for structured power intervals that I think you can't beat a trainer really. So getting rid of variables is the thing you want to do. All right. And it looks like the last question we have here. And if you do have any more, go ahead and submit them of course. Uh, but the last question we have is 
so I'm a this person's new to the world of triathlon, Chad, and it looks like they're trying to decide between if they should go for uh, one of the Olympic or the Olympic plan or the sprint plan, and they don't know the different what the difference is in between the two of them. I know the tri plans are brand new, right, Chad? So yeah. if you're just getting into triathlon, I assume that you're probably doing sprint work. That that's but. my guess. Um, the the Olympic plans will probably build a, build a more uh, or a more well rounded rider in that um, the distances are a little bit longer. Um, they're also quite a bit more demanding, and so is a training load. So if you're if you're new to triathlon, I'm guessing your first events are going to be sprint. But if you think you're going to jump right into Olympic level or Olympic distance racing, for sure the Olympic plan. Yeah, but, and uh, if you, and if you can give us any information um, there on what you're actually doing, Eric, as far as how long. Um, if you haven't picked an doing. event and you're not entirely sure what sort of distance you're going to land on, then start with the sprint one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it looks like it's a, yeah, it's a sprint try. So that's perfect. There you go. Yep. yep. Absolutely. Yeah, we got plans for that. So wonderful. All right. Thank you guys so much. Uh, that that covers the Training with Power 101 webinar. If you do have any more questions, feel free to reach out to us at support at trainerroad.com. Go on to Trainer Road and check out our help center. It's got a lot of really valuable information. Um, they, well, it should answer the majority of the questions that you may have, even the training questions. There's a whole section on that. If you can also get a hold of us via live chat on our site uh, during certain hours. You'll see a little bubble pop or bubble sitting there in the window, not popping up and annoying you, just hanging out. And you can click on that and chat with one of our support agents. They're very well trained. Um, they should be able to answer your questions in a, in a quick manner. Uh, and yeah, by all means, reach out to us. That's what we're here for. So thanks again for attending the Training with Power 101 webinar and happy training. Thanks, everybody.